Hello and welcome to another game review. Today we're looking at Minoria, a 2D Metroidvania developed by Bomb Service, published by Dongan Entertainment, and released in August 2019. We'll be looking at what it does right, what it does wrong, and answering the quintessential question, is it worth your money? Now if at any point you think I'm doing a good job, please consider leaving a like, and if my content interests you, I'd appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button. It really does help me out since despite the overwhelming support I've received lately, I'm not yet big enough to abuse the community poll feature and get the big boy numbers. Alright, enough of that, let's get into it. First up, the technical bits. Minoria is available on PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. This review was done on the PC version of the game. The specs for PC are on screen now, and they're very reasonable, with even the recommended specs being available on a low to mid-range system. As far as performance goes, framerate was through the roof when uncapped, consistently staying over 400 FPS even with my recording software running in the background. Though I will say it's a bit disappointing that it only offers caps at 30 and 60 FPS considering my monitor can support up to 75. During my playtime, I encountered no major bugs or glitches and performance was smooth throughout except for a single freeze the first time I saved the game. After that one issue, everything ran perfectly and I experienced no stutters, hitches, freezes, or crashes. Overall, on a technical level, the game holds up very well. On to visuals. The backgrounds are layered, 2D, hand-painted artwork with the characters being cel-shaded. Stylistically, I do like how the game looks and it definitely has its own visual identity, though I'd imagine this is going to be a mostly subjective thing. One thing I appreciate is the layered backgrounds. Each area of the game will have background layers that move at different speeds as you traverse the level, giving an effective illusion of depth. It really does a lot to make the areas feel real, despite the fact that you're locked to a 2D plane. Each location has its own color palette, and even when two locations are meant to be similar in appearance, such as the main cathedral area and the jail, the different colors do a lot to distinguish each location. When you move from one area to another, you'll know it. The animations were very crisp, everything from standard stuff like running and dodge rolling to enemy movement and the complex attacks of the player character is all done very well and I was impressed. One last thing I'll mention is the use of white and red in combat. When you swing your weapon there will be a big white arc following your sword. Enemy attacks will almost always leave a trail of red. There will be a big red circle to indicate most enemy attacks. When you parry an attack, you'll see a red circle followed by the white slashes of your counterattack. It really did a lot to get me immersed in the game. Overall, visually, I definitely liked it, though I'm going to leave the final conclusion up to you. Sound and Music From my experience with the game, the sound design tends to follow a philosophy of subtle but effective. The simple things like footsteps, the slashing of your sword, and the grunts and slashes of the enemies all worked. Everything in terms of sound effects maintained a high baseline of quality and worked to complement the gameplay effectively, though nothing about it ever made me stop and admire it. The music, in the same vein, is mostly atmospheric, invoking an eerie, foreboding, or even calming attitude much of the time. It does noticeably pick up during big combat events, mainly the bosses and mini-bosses, but for the most part, the point is to get you immersed in the locations, and I feel it did so effectively, though this isn't music I'm ever going to listen to on my own. That being said, there are many who really do love the soundtrack, and I fully understand why, even though I don't feel the same. I'll have music from the soundtrack playing in the background of this video, so make your own decisions. Overall, I found that the audio of Minoria was pretty good. On to story. The story is set in a fantasy world based on medieval Europe and it utilizes a lot of Roman Catholic symbolism throughout. The way it works is that you play as Sister Semela, a nun in the service of the church. Though one thing to note is that the nuns in this world unexpectedly fill the role of the Spanish Inquisition under an organization called the Sacred Office. You know, burning heretics, enforcing religious law, that whole thing. One big deviation between this world and the real world is that witches are actually real and the story is actually set in what's known as the Fourth Witch War. The main plot is fairly simple. As mentioned earlier, you play as Sister Semela accompanied by Sister Fran. You make your way to the cathedral to meet up with some other nuns, only to find that they're all dead, the monarch is in trouble, and the witches are planning some sort of ritual that you must stop. Again, fairly simple, but an easy to understand premise and a good way to get us into the action without overloading the player with too much information early on. As you progress through the game, you'll encounter little bits of lore along the way and meet with characters friendly and hostile. Through dialogue with these characters, along with notes and archives you'll find, the latter essentially being collectible lore books, you'll learn more about the conflict between the church and the witches, their motivations, and things will start to become morally ambiguous. As you might imagine with the obvious references to Roman Catholicism in medieval Europe, the church isn't exactly this righteous pillar of morality that they claim to be, and are responsible for just as much or more evil and suffering as the witches, who themselves are morally ambiguous. The player character, Sister Semela, is a bit of a blank slate character and you can sort of mold her attitudes towards the church and those around her through dialogue choices. This doesn't affect all that much, but it's kinda neat to see how the various characters react to different choices. 
there are also multiple endings tied to a single choice made towards the end. No spoilers, but I will say that there is no definitive good or bad ending. Each has their own positives and negatives, and it's left up to the player to decide which they like more. A lot of the storytelling of Minoria hinges on its lore and how it presents these ideas to the player, leaving a lot up to interpretation. While I do like this style of storytelling through osmosis, I do feel like a lot of the themes weren't properly explored, and I think there could have been more of a deeper look at these factions and some of the ramifications of the conflict between the church and the witches. Additionally, there are a lot of interesting characters you come across, notably many of the bosses, that are really intriguing from a design perspective, but you don't really get much of a chance to really interact with them or learn from them. I mean, let's take a look at Fricka, the leader of a band of thieves that basically took over the prison underneath the cathedral. She's shown to be evil. I mean, she kidnapped an entire family with the intent of selling them into slavery. She's also brutal and ruthless, willing to cut down anyone in her way and anyone who pisses her off, including allies. But all you really get from her are these tiny bits of characterization, and then you kill her and she's completely forgotten. And this is a trend with most of the named enemies you fight. Once they're dead, it's like they never existed, and I'd like to see more. And before I move on, I have to talk a bit about the localization. Bomb Service is Brazilian, so I'm guessing that the game was originally done in Portuguese. Regardless, it's pretty clear that it's not originally in English. Now, don't get me wrong, the English localization is all perfectly understandable, there was never any kind of barrier there. However, throughout the game, there were noticeable instances of poor grammar and word choice, and even some instances of improper conjugation and incorrect sentence structure. For example, there was one line that went, You fought with much bravely. Bravely is an adverb, and they were looking for a noun. It should have been, you fought with much bravery, or you fought bravely. These are not the kind of mistakes a native English speaker would make, and it's one of the main reasons I always advocate for localizations to be done by native speakers whenever possible. Again, the localization was competent enough, but the presentation was hurt by the errors. Overall, I found the story of Minoria to be decent but lacking in depth. It's good at establishing and maintaining the setting, but aside from that, I found myself wanting more than I was given. Finally, on to gameplay. As mentioned way back at the start of the video, Minoria is a 2D Metroidvania action platformer, meaning exploration and opening up new pathways. The combat system is a melee-centric hack-and-slash kind of deal, with a heavy emphasis on learning enemy movement and attack patterns. Your main way of dealing with enemies is by smacking the shit out of them with your sword. Really, as far as attacking goes, there's mostly just your standard slash, though there are a few unlockable maneuvers as you progress throughout the game, and the timing does change up a bit when you're in the air. Defensively, you have two main ways of dealing with enemy attacks, dodging and parrying. Dodging is pretty self-explanatory. You get a roll while well, you're basically dashing a direction, moving through enemies and getting a few invincibility frames. Parrying requires timing a button press to an incoming enemy attack. Time it correctly and you'll block damage entirely, perform a powerful counterattack, and then get a short burst of invincibility when you're finished, mostly so that you don't take damage due to being movement restricted. It's worth noting that parrying boss attacks will only block damage and you will not counterattack. These two systems are fairly simple, but rely on learning how all the enemies work, and make no mistake, you'll have to learn to utilize both if you want to complete the game. Some attacks are designed in such a way that you can't effectively parry them, and sometimes you'll be fighting enemies on a small platform where rolling becomes impractical. And I feel like many of the bosses almost scream for you to utilize one method of defense over the other. The main combat of this game is deceptively simple, but it has a surprisingly high skill ceiling, and I found the combat to be consistently satisfying and challenging throughout my playthrough. Now before I continue, I do have to mention that Minoria very clearly takes some inspiration from the Soulsborne genre in both aesthetic choices and gameplay elements with Dark Souls seemingly being the main inspiration. Aside from the big white victory message when you kill a boss and the red you have died message that looked just like something from Dark Souls, things like how powerful rolling is as a defensive tool, iframes and all, parrying to deliver devastating counterattacks, and even the fact that you have set respawn points scattered throughout the game. These all feel distinctly Souls-esque, and it's kinda cool to see these elements in a Metroidvania. To be clear, Minoria is not just 2D Dark Souls. It's much faster paced, exploration is different, and there's a lot more mobility in general, among other differences, but I do think it's worth noting the similarities. In addition to the standard melee combat, you also get a rudimentary magic system known as incense. The way it works is that you can find and purchase various incenses throughout the game. You have three slots for active incenses and two slots for passive ones. Passive incense will, as the name implies, give you a passive bonus for having it equipped, such as restoring a portion of your health whenever you kill an enemy. Active incenses require you to actually use them and will give you some sort of bonus or launch some sort of attack. You only have limited uses of your active incenses, but they will refill upon using a save point. You start out with five healing incenses, and these honestly act kind of like Estus flasks in Dark Souls, though they don't leave you vulnerable for long. 
As I played, I found a lot of the active incenses to be pretty underwhelming and the damage was usually not worth all that much. The way I played through basically the entire game was I had my three slots and one was for my healing incense, one was for an incense that temporarily increases attack damage which I'd use at the start of boss fights, and one damage dealing one that I'd just completely unload at the start of boss fights. You have so few charges on every incense that you're pretty much discouraged from ever using them except during boss fights, which I think is a bit of a shame. This is especially true when you consider that enemies respawn whenever you leave a room, so even if you use incenses to clear certain specific groups of tricky enemies, you're at risk of running out if you have to backtrack at all. It's not a terrible system, but it's one that I feel like has a lot of unrealized potential to the point where the game itself doesn't really show it any love outside of basic stuff like having a heal. Enemies in Minoria also follow a bit of that Dark Souls style in that pretty much every enemy has the potential to kill you at any point in the game. These guys all hit pretty damn hard and if you let yourself get overwhelmed, that spells trouble. Later on in the game, you'll encounter enemies and bosses that'll straight up hit you harder than your incense can heal in a single use. It encourages you to actually take every enemy into consideration and I like how you can't just steamroll any part of the game by sheer numbers. The element of skill and game knowledge shines because when I quickly go through enemies, I found myself adjusting my strategy based on things like how quickly I can kill them with basic attacks, what movement patterns the enemies have, and whether it's worth killing them via parries or if I can kill them faster by rolling and attacking like normal. It was all very satisfying and I found myself engaged throughout my experience. The game also features a very rudimentary leveling system. Essentially, as you kill enemies, you get experience points. Get enough and you gain a level, which grants you a small amount of max health and attack power. Individually, levels don't do very much, but they do add up over time. I don't have all that much to say about it. It's about as bare bones as you can get, and I don't think it hurts anything, but it was always something that was in the background for me rather than something to focus on. One thing I definitely have to praise is how the level design ends up playing out. Overall, I found it to have a very cyclical feel, where I never felt like I had to backtrack excessively in order to properly explore. Whenever I'd make my way through a section, more often than not it would loop me back to a familiar area where I could just continue to make progress. A good example of this would be a pickup I noticed right near the starting room that was inaccessible for Metroidvania reasons. Well, later on in the game, not that long after I picked up the upgrade needed to collect the pickup, the main story path took me right near that starting area again so I didn't have to trudge my way back all the way to the beginning. It was really nice and it felt like the developers understood that in a Metroidvania I want to explore new areas, not continually retread old ground. There definitely is some backtracking here and there, and it's not like the level design funnels you into specific places all the time, but it was clear that a lot of care was put into making the entire map feel like a cohesive unit. And now, I gotta talk about the bosses. Ever since I made that Dark Souls comparison, I'm sure that some of you have been wondering if that includes tough boss fights. And the answer to that question is… yeah, mostly. Throughout the game, you'll come across both bosses and mini-bosses. The mini-bosses are basically just big scary enemies that can kill you but aren't quite as individually threatening. For one, your parries deliver counterattacks as normal so you can still wail on them that way. But one thing that I think makes mini-bosses scary in a way that bosses aren't is that you never know when they're coming. With bosses, you'll kinda know that they'll probably show up at the end of the section and there will almost always be a save point beforehand. With mini-bosses, there's none of that. You walk into a room and there's a big boy right there, and let me tell you, there is quite a bit of butthole clenching when you don't want to lose all your progress. It adds a degree of tension even though the mini-bosses themselves are honestly not that tough to deal with. But of course, the mini-bosses don't even compare to the threat of the actual bosses. Well, actually that's not entirely true for the most part. One thing I found is that many of the bosses really didn't pose that much of a threat to me. Up until the very end, I was breezing my way through most of the bosses simply due to the fact that you typically have a good amount of space to maneuver so I was able to abuse the hell out of the iframes you get from rolling. I was able to kill some of the bosses without even properly learning their attack patterns because I just roll behind them every time they did an animation. However, the later into the game, the harder the bosses got, as you'd probably expect. And I found the final two bosses to be incredibly fun. I also don't think it's a coincidence that these two bosses, which are far and above my favorites, also contributed to probably 75% of my overall deaths. I had to learn their attack patterns, the timing of their animations, and when exactly I could afford to get a quick hit in and when I had to focus on defense. After killing the final boss, I was left almost a little disappointed. I had an absolute blast in the fight, but I kind of wish all the bosses in the game had that degree of challenge. Minoria is a game that rewards skill and knowledge, and I feel like a lot of the bosses don't quite live up to that. I mean, the controls are very tight and the mechanics themselves scream easy to learn, hard to master, so a few more high difficulty bosses would have been greatly appreciated. 
Still, none of the bosses were outright bad, just a little on the easy side. Like many Metroidvanias, a big part of Minoria is exploration, collectibles, and secrets. I played through pretty casually, exploring where I could, but mostly just stumbling my way through the game. I thought I did a decent job hunting everything down, but by the time I finished the game, I hadn't even collected half the coins scattered throughout, and I missed a ton of lore books. If you're the type of player that loves hunting down all the hidden secrets in a game, you're going to enjoy Minoria. But even if you're not, you can still just do what I did and you'll get by on just the things you come across. After beating the game, you'll unlock a few things. You get a few cool items and some lore, shit like that, but you'll also get two new portals. One is essentially a gauntlet mode where you'll fight waves of enemies and it's pretty tough. I like it, but then again, I've always been a fan of optional challenge modes in games for those who really want to master them. The other portal is New Game Plus and it works pretty much the same as in most other games. You play through the story again, but you retain your items, levels, and unlocked skills. In exchange, enemies are stronger and give more XP. It's a fine system and it allows you to continue playing if you enjoy the core gameplay loop. Plus, I find this to be a good way to go about getting the other ending. Yeah, you can't just save, kill the final boss, get an ending, and repeat. You have to actually go through an entirely separate playthrough if you want both endings. I'm not entirely certain how I feel about that, but I do get what the developers were going for. It makes that final choice actually have impact when you know you can't just go back and see what happens if you make the other decision. You actually have to really put in the work if you want to do that. It's kinda neat, but I can definitely see it rubbing people the wrong way. Overall, I'd say the gameplay of Minoria is pretty solid. It has a very strong foundation, and though I do have a few grapes about some of the design decisions, I think that as a complete project, this is a fun game to play. So overall, what do I think? Minoria is a neat little metroidvania with fun combat, good level design, and an interesting, if somewhat shallow, world. It does a lot right and not a lot wrong, though I feel that while the game has an absolute ton of potential, it doesn't quite smash through the barrier to be on the same level as other modern day Metroidvania classics, like Hollow Knight, The Messenger, or Ori in the Blind Forest. Still, it's a good experience and I'm glad to have played it. So if you've watched any of my reviews, you'll know that I hate traditional review scores. I don't think they do a damn bit of good, so I'm going to ask and answer the question that's really on your mind. Is Minoria worth your money? Minoria is available on PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4 for $20 US or your regional equivalent. At that price point, I'd say it really depends on the kind of player you are. If you're the type who loves picking up part of Metroidvania, discovering all the hidden collectibles, and will gladly go through the game a second time for that second ending, the game is absolutely worth your money. If you're the type to just power through a game to the end and put it down, $20 is a bit much for the amount of playtime on offer. I finished my initial run through the game just around 4 hours, so it's not a very long game unless you include all the additional exploring and a second playthrough. So with that in mind, I'm going to rate Minoria as worth your money, but just barely. If you're a one and done kind of player, you should wait for a sale, at which point I'd say it's well worth picking up. Thanks for watching, and thank you for all the support I've been getting since I've been gone. You know, I was initially planning on taking just a short break, a week or two to relax a bit, maybe work on some behind the scenes stuff, and then I went and got COVID. <laughs> yep, someone at work gave me the coronavirus and I was just laid out. There was absolutely no chance in hell I was in any state to work on videos. But in that time, somehow, the channel rocketed right past the 500 sub mark, and by the time this video is out, it's probably going to be closer to 550, and just, holy shit. So thanks again for all that, and, well, I'm back. Once again, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Play the Electro Swing.